For those of you here for the first time this year, and if we haven't seen you, Happy New Year. I pray that uh, this year will be a year of God's provision for you, His grace, His Spirit leading you. And just uh, seeing this beautiful family step off here, Wahida and Musa, can I just ask if we can just pause and pray for them? Father, we pray over Musa and Wahida Masinga that you would cover them as parents and just lead them through this season. Thank you for their children, for Eli, Father, for Bekeve, and our Father, I pray your grace over them in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, I believe the Lord is saying for us in 2023 that things are going to speed up. And because things are going to speed up, it's really important for us to recognize that we are in a year of consequence. Meaning, I believe God is saying this is a pivotal year. That 2023 is a crucial year, a tipping point year. In other words, the decisions that we make in 2023 is definitely going to impact us in 2024. And so we believe the theme of this year is sowing in faith, hope, and love. That we need to be intentional to sow in faith, hope, and love. You might be thinking, well, what seed have I got? And remember last week we covered that. You have the Word of God. You have the grace of God. You have the blood of Jesus. You have the authority of the name of Jesus the Christ. You have seed. He's given everyone a measure of seed. You might be thinking, but I've got such small seed. Maybe you even think it's insignificant seed. You know, Helen and I had the privilege of traveling to California um, several years ago. And when we got there, we had wonderful friends who took us down into uh, Yosemite Valley and we saw the red wood forest. You know, some of those trees, the tallest ones, are 106 to 110 meters tall. They are seven meters wide. Imagine seeing a tree 106 meters tall, seven meters wide. Huge. But you know, the, the seed of that tree is no bigger than the seed the size of a maize seed. Such a small seed, almost insignificant, but when planted and sown in the right soil, in the right conditions, it becomes a significant tree. Incredibly significant. So right now, don't despise the seed that you've got. Don't despise it. Don't think it's so insignificant. It's significant. And God wants you to thrive in 2023 emotionally, and spiritually. He wants us to thrive. And you have the seed, the seed, the word of God. You have words that you speak, the power of life and death is in the tongue. You have relationships. You also have time. Every one of you have got time to sow. So the question is, so where? Where do we sow? We, you know, when I mention seed, a lot of times, oftentimes people make the mistake of thinking that I'm talking about finances only, but actually I'm talking about time, your thoughts, your words that you speak, and the actions that you take. Because the Lord would have you sow. He wants us to sow. He wants us to take that word and, and put it into the blessing the family, blessing the church, blessing the community. He wants you to invest time. But so many, when I say seed, because we all know seed and we come from an agrarian society where we used to, in the holidays, planting and sowing seed. But unfortunately, the church has taken that word seed. And as soon as I say seed, people think you're talking about money. And you've had pastors come along and say, not in this church, but you've had pastors out there who say, hey, if you plant seed, the word, uh, money, in them, in the next five minutes, five, next five minutes, if you plant seed in the next five minutes, as it comes in, you, you'll get a blessing. And if you bring seed to them, the good soil, so therefore you'll get a 30, 60, 100-fold return, praise the Lord. And uh, the more seed you get, the more blessing you get. Uh, and if you bring good seed, Sure, you get a really good prophecy and a wonderful prayer. And then the economy melts down. And then the world shakes. And suddenly people are disappointed because the seed that they were told to sow 
didn't bring them the 30, 60, or 100 fold return. And they get disappointed with God. They get disappointed with pastors. They get disappointed with the church. And I believe that we're in a season somewhat like that. If you know what I'm talking about, could you just put up your hand and say, okay, you're not alone. Only a few hands, right? Did you know that in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, Jesus never charged anyone for prayer? Check your gospel. Did you know that Jesus never charged anyone for prophecy? Did you know that Jesus never charged anyone for a word of knowledge? Jesus didn't even charge anyone for healing, and neither did his disciples. So a lot of people are sowing, thinking that they're sowing as God has led them. But Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, for a lack of understanding the whole word of God. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, where there's no revelation, where there's no understanding of God's word, where there's no grasp of what God's word is, people cast off restraint. So in 2023, I think the church, the family, needs to recognize as spiritual deception increases, we need to intentionally be led by the Holy Spirit to sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh. I don't know about you, but the last three years was tough. How many would you agree that the last three years was tough? The last three years was tough. And as tough as it was, many of us have sown and maybe not seen the fruit that we want to see. Well, Jesus addresses this. And so I believe that God wants us to talk about four points that work together. Tell your neighbor together. The four points work together. It's not in isolation. In Luke 13, verse 6, Jesus is speaking, and he says to the, the disciples, a certain man, a parable he gives, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on the fig tree and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years, interesting it says three years, because the last three years have been tough. For three years, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why do you use up the ground with it? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. As I share that, if, I, if you want to bear good fruit, I believe there are four things I get out of this. The first that I get out of it is, and this might surprise you, if you're going to sow, sowing begins in our own heart. And I'm not talking about accumulated wealth, and I'm not talking about comfort. I'm talking about the fact that God has given you seed, His Word. He's given you His promises. He's given you His grace. He's given you His blood. He's given you His body. He's given you His Spirit. So He's given you seed. And I believe that he wants you to take that seed and align your hearts, align our hearts underneath his word, underneath his thoughts, underneath his promises. Look at Proverbs 4.23. He says, guard your own heart, for out of it comes the issues of life. So God tells us that our heart, our mind, will, and emotions, the way we think, the way we uh, take action based on our thoughts is an outflowing of where our soul is, where our heart is. In order to sow where God wants us to sow, first we need to invite God to work in on our hearts. All of us need God to work on our hearts. Remember, Jesus said that if it's not bearing fruit, dig the hardened soil around it. Dig around it. We have a lychee tree at home, and some years this lychee tree doesn't bear a harvest at all, a very little. But the years that we aerate the soil, dig up around the lychee tree roots, and the years we put cow manure around it, that year the fruit is always good. In the same way, each one of us want to bear fruit of the Spirit, but then we need to let God work on our roots, where our roots are. We need to let God deal with our issues. Hosea 10 verse 12 says, Sow for yourselves, listen again, 
sow for yourselves righteousness, right relationship with God and man, reap in mercy, but break up your fallow ground, which means your hardened ground. For it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. Fallow ground. He's saying, deal with your heart before the Lord. So sowing should begin in our own hearts, recognizing we need God to work on us. We need God to help us, and we shouldn't just go out and sow words and speak things. And unless we've checked with the Lord, we align our hearts. But for so many of us, we've all got issues. We've all got stuff that we've been hiding, and we've been covering that pain and the offenses and the disappointment that God needs to work on our hearts. And we need to invite Him in to work on our hearts and when we align, we will bear fruit. I remember a specific time in the men's center when we started the men's center. And um, at that, in those days, like you've heard before, uh, you know, really, we only had beans for breakfast, beans for lunch, and beans for dinner. Day in, day out, for a whole year, beans for breakfast, beans for lunch, beans for dinner, nothing else. And the students came and said, Pastor Kevin, please, can we have something else? I said, well, we don't have any money. Let's pray. And we prayed and praise God there was an answer to prayer. Next minute, 32 cases of chicken feet and chicken heads were delivered. Praise God. Hey, what a delicacy. It was a miracle. 32 cases of chicken feet and chicken heads. It was amazing. It wasn't long until the chicken feet and the chicken heads ran out. And now we didn't have any money and we had no food in the pantry. And so I started praying, and I got on my knees, and I was desperate before God for food for the center. And as I was praying, the Lord convicted me and said, Kevin, you hurt that person when you use those words to speak to that person. I said, but Lord, he's wrong. That's why I use those words. He's wrong. <laughs> and the Lord said, it doesn't matter whether he's wrong, and you're right. I'm calling you to be righteous. I'm calling you to sow righteousness in your heart right relationship with God and right relationship with others, you make right. I was so disappointed, but God was right. <laughs> you know, God's always right. So I picked up the phone and I called the guy and I, I said, listen, please will you forgive me? And the Lord's just convicted me that when I said that, that it, it hurt you. Would you please forgive me? And the person said, yes, praise God. I put the phone down. Do you know, not more than 30 minutes later, a four-ton truck, without any contact from me, a four-ton truck came over the road filled with food. I'm talking chicken breast, chicken leg. I'm talking, I'm talking ice cream. I, I'm telling you even prawns. I, really, four tons. You see, there'd been a flood in Imaban. And... Um, the, some of the shops were damaged, and uh, sadly for them, but one man's disaster is another man's gain. <laughs> and so these guys had four tons of food, the top food. But it started with God saying, Kevin, your heart's wrong. Sort your heart out. And so if we want to bear fruit this year, we need to let God work on our hearts. You know, forgiving others is in your best interest. Asking for forgiveness is in your best interest. Over the passage of time, I've really recognized in ministry, the only person that can stop you from receiving God's blessings is you. How you respond, how you react. I loved what uh, John Bevere once said. He said, no demon, no man, and no devil can stop you from God's best blessings. Only you can. The biggest block is us. And so I believe God wants us to align our hearts with Him, to come underneath His Spirit, that our heart be led by His Spirit, that we don't get led by pain, by our feelings or by our offenses. But this year, 2023, we're led by the Spirit of God and His grace. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 for a moment. Paul writes, he says, 
But this I say, can you tell your neighbor that's for you? This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let everyone give as he purposes where? In his heart. So our heart has to come underneath the grace of God. Not grudgingly or out of necessity. Oh, because you said so, Lord. I'm going to do this because you told me I have to do it. I'm going to do it because the word of God says I must do it. Not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Now look at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace, supernatural empowering grace, abound to you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So he's talking about a grace there that comes upon you to perform his good work. When he gives you the vision, he gives you the provision. And so the grace here is to sow into your heart, recognizing that every one of our hearts have been hardened. Every one of us need the, the soil aerated around our issues. Every one of us need to allow God to redirect the roots from where we've been putting it into his love, where we tap into his love. And so in order to sort our hearts out, the second one comes where God says we are to sow into fellowship with him. Sow into fellowship with him. Sowing takes time. It takes energy. It takes commitment. I don't know how the Lord calls you, but oftentimes the Lord calls me to an appointment with him early in the morning. Different people, different things. For me, God will wake me up and say at 3.30 or 4, get up, I want to speak to you. And so the commitment is to meet with him and listen to him. And as we allow him to work on our hearts where we repent, look at what Joel hears. Joel hears this from the Lord in Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, Israel had hardened their hearts. They'd been in a place of rebellion. They were in a bad head space. They were frustrated and disappointed. And so the Lord speaks to them. He says, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. With fasting, and we start this year with fasting. With weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Sure. And when they did that, the blessing started to flow. Their eyes were open to the presence of God. Listen to verse 19. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. And you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach amongst the nations. He didn't just stop there. He goes on to say, I will pour my spirit out on all your people. On your sons and daughters. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will receive dreams and your young men will receive visions. I will pour out my spirit, he said, even on the servants, on the men servants and the maid servants. See, God's heart is that we all thrive spiritually and emotionally. But it starts with us taking our hearts and coming to the Father and fellowshipping with the Father. Allowing the Father to correct us. Allowing the Father to, to shape us. Remember James 4 verse 8, he says, Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. He's calling us into this place of fellowship in 2023, where we give God time, so time, so energy, so commitment. See him as a priority. See him as your first love, a priority in your life. I remember once getting really, really offended with someone who'd ripped us off. Even as a pastor, you know, you sometimes get people who rip you off. 
I would say, especially as a pastor, we get people knocking. Anyway, so this one time, this person really ripped us off, and, and I was before the Lord and just moaning, you know, in self-pity. Like, Lord, bring justice to this person. Deal with this person. I can't believe, Lord, that this person... And as I'm praying, thinking that I've brought my heart to the Lord, the Lord challenged me and said to me, Kevin, repent. I said, why, 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 why repent? Because you're in your flesh, Kevin. I want you to come into the Spirit. Repent. So as I repented and asked God for forgiveness, and then he said, Kevin, I want you to start praying for that person. So I started praying. Yes, Lord. Mm, Lord, deal with him, Father. Sort him out. Uh, the Lord said, don't do that. Pray with him as if it's you. Because I died for you when, I w when you were in your sin. I gave my son when you were in sin. Pray for him as if it's you. <laughs> Lord, bless him, Father. Give him great joy, Father. Give him great grace. I, oh, the prayer changed. Tell your neighbor the prayer changed. You know, when God says pray for you, things change. <laughs> as I prayed, the happiness just left me. Really, the oppression of offense left me. And as I was sitting in the presence of God, fellowshipping now with God, literally as I'm on my knees, as I'm on my knees there, what happens is the email pings, bing, and I, I went and checked what. And it was an email in from a friend in the United States of America with a letter saying, you know, we just felt of the Lord we needed to give you this as a gift. It was the exact amount that we'd been ripped off on. The reason why I'm sharing that story is James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Be doers of the word and not only hearers, lest you deceive yourself. You see, the problem with us in the church is, we often hear what God is telling us. Forgive, but we don't forgive. Bless, but we don't bless. Share that prophetic word, but we don't share that prophetic word. Pray for that person, but we don't pray for that person. God is calling us to be doers of the word and not just hearers. Because if we do not apply the word, we immediately deceive ourselves. So this year, can I ask you to think about giving your time to God, making Him your priority, making Him your first love, above even your spouse. And by the way, when you fellowship with God, He heals your heart, right? And as He heals your heart, and you spend time with Him in the love of God, what actually happens is you get up and you start loving your spouse better. So many times I've had to tell this church and confess to you, and I'm going to confess again. Helen has to tell me, Kevin, spend some time with the Lord, please. Why? Because as I receive the love of God, I love her better. I love the children better. And then I love the colleagues that I work with better. That's how God works. Sometimes we get blunt with each other. Sometimes we find our patience is wearing. Well, the solution is to push into God. He calls us to fellowship with Him and fellowship with others. He calls us to fellowship with the church, His family. In 2023, can I encourage you to worship together, to fellowship together, to push into the presence of God? Because God calls you not just to fellowship with Him, but to love others as He loves you. Look at Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not, not neglect our meeting together. Let's not stop meeting together. Let's not neglect our meeting together. As some people have, and in 2021 and 2022, it got so easy because of COVID not to fellowship with one another. As some people do, but rather encourage one another, especially, tell your neighbor, especially. Uh, tell him again, especially. You know why? Especially as the day of his return is drawing near. We need each other. We need each other because iron sharpens iron. And I've noticed that even in uh, the men's program, the women's program, 
people who pull out of church fellowship for two Sundays in a row, I find that the people who have been coming off drugs like heroin, who pull out of church for two Sundays in a row, are by the third Sunday on drugs again. There's something about fellowshipping with God and then finding your local church where iron sharpens iron and you challenge yourself. Listen, I know people are messy because I'm messy. And because people are messy and we don't like the way that they do things, sometimes going to church is really messy. The scripture in Proverbs comes and says in Proverbs 14 verse 4, when no, where no, where no oxen are, the trough is clean. But much increase, tell your neighbor increase. Tell your neighbor this year, I want increase. <laughs> now watch. <laughs> but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. In other words, if you want increase, it's going to be messier. But the good news is, that as messy as it is, because he's talking about manure here, right? He's talking about fertilizer. As messy as that is, God takes that manure and he puts it on your roots to help you to grow. Remember, God said that those roots need digging, aerating, and sometimes it needs manure. Sometimes God takes what was meant for bad and uses it for your good. Some, sometimes we look across and we think the grass is greener on the other side. Northern Ireland, the grass is really green, family. Do you know why? It rains a lot. A lot. And they put a manure on the ground. It's green because it rains and there's manure. Somebody watered it. Somebody worked the ground. Somebody fertilized that ground. Manure isn't your worst enemy. Mess in church isn't your worst enemy. God wants to work on our heart through fellowship with him and fellowship with others. I was reading about how there's a, believe it or not, a manure crisis in 1894 in New York City. Who would have thought? Imagine they had more than 200 horses in New York City in 1894. And each horse would uh, uh, deposit about 10 to 15 kilograms a day. Now imagine 200,000 horses at 10 to 15 kilograms a day. They worked out it's about 2 million to 3 million kilograms of manure a day on the streets. And sometimes those streets were knee high. Imagine the road knee high in manure and it's raining. Can you imagine walking across the road as you get to the other side? Imagine the ladies' dresses. And when it was hot and dry. But the good news is somebody made collection of mature manure and selling it to the farmers as their business. And it was a good business. Not only that, Henry Ford was trying to work out a way to make cars to dispense of a horse. And so in 1896 to 1898, Henry Ford came and produced and advertised cars for the first time. The first adverts were this, dispense with a horse. Isn't that amazing? So God took a problem and he helped to create a solution. And we get to this church today in cars coming from that time. I believe God is saying to us, that even if church is messy, he can take that mess and make it your good. But put effort, put time, be intentional to sow into fellowship with God and with one another. The third one is this, sow into discipleship. We're in a time where we absolutely need to know the word of God because people are training people to believe that what God says is good is evil. And what God says is evil is good. Deception is on the increase. God defines what is good and what is evil. And unless we know the word, you can sometimes believe that the thing in our heart, you know the idol, sometimes people have, um, for example, sometimes a guy has a girl in mind and even though God is saying that not, this isn't the right girl or a, a girl has a guy in mind and even though God is saying this guy isn't the right guy, sometimes 
even in business, people can have an idol in their heart. In ministry, you can have an idol in their heart. And we go to the Lord with that idol, wanting that idol more than God, asking God to give us that idol. Ezekiel 14 verse 4 is an alarming scripture. The Lord says, tell them this is what the sovereign Lord says. The people of Israel have set up idols in their hearts, and they've fallen into sin. And then they go to the prophet, asking the prophet to give them a message, to seal the, the prayer, to uh, ensure that the message is, is that they can have this relationship or this business or this loan. So I, the Lord, will give them the kind of answer their great idolatry deserves. I don't know about you, but that's frightening. In other words, God gives them over to the desires of their flesh. We see this, if you think that's Old Testament, Ezekiel, that, that that's just Old Testament. No, Romans chapter 1 says the same thing. God gave them over to their flesh. And God warns us that in end times, that there will be greater deception. So he's calling us into discipleship. Jesus raised followers who were called disciples, meaning learners, followers of Christ, not just of his doctrine in Scripture, but of his lifestyle as well. The goal of discipleship is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not to the image of the world, but the image of Jesus. The disciples learned from Jesus, but the fruit of disciples was to disciple others. So I have a question for you. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus? And a second question, are you discipling others? Because in Matthew 28, Jesus spoke, and he spoke in verse 19. He said, go therefore, tell your neighbor, that's you. Go therefore, he's talking to you. There's no one in this room that he's not talking to. He says, go therefore, and make disciples. He's calling us to disciple people of all the nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, that's discipleship, to observe all things that I've committed to you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. How do we do this? We sow time, energy, resources, into discipling ourselves, allowing Jesus to deal with our heart, coming into fellowship with him, fellowship with the saints. And we do this. Please, can I challenge you? Are you reading your Bible on a daily basis? I, I would recommend this, this app that, that you, you look, consider reading your Bible every year, the whole Bible. Just consider reading the Bible. Here's an app that you can go to in U version and learn to read your Bible in a year. Because the Word of God is health to your flesh. It's strength to your bones. And the Spirit of God brings life. It's living and active. And when quickened by the Holy Spirit, brings life to you. So you can bring life to your relationships. You can bring life to your workplace. He wants to bring life to you that you can thrive this year. The second thing you can do is spend time listening to God. Reading the Word. The Word is God. But listen to him too. He's speaking. Jesus says, you will know my voice. Listen to him. Journal maybe. Faithfully attend your local church because God uses the messy church to work on our hearts. One person once said to me, but I don't like going to your church because I don't like the way you preach. I didn't take offense because I understand what that means. But you don't come for the preacher, you come for Jesus and the Spirit of God working through whatever He's doing in the church. And the last thing I think that we can do, please, I'd like you to consider is we produce these new books, the foundation books. They're basic discipleship man manuals. Could you consider in 2023 that you would go through this discipleship book yourself with somebody and then you would go and find somebody else? It's not about bringing them to Potter's Wheel. Find somebody else, family or friend, 
and ask them if you can disciple them. I remember the time Dean Carlson, a friend of mine, did that to me. He kept calling me to come and have a cup of coffee with some friends. You know, to give up an hour a week seemed a lot. So we would go up for one hour to have lunch, and a couple of the first few times I missed. I was too busy, was stuck in a rut. But after a while, when I got into that meeting, and I allowed myself to be accountable in that small group, memorizing scripture and going through the material, God started doing something in my heart. The first couple of times I was filled with pride. I was a little embarrassed. But when I let the Holy Spirit work on me and humble me, He started changing me. And knowing the Word became important as I realized the times that we're in. So, so into discipleship this year. The fourth and the last one is this, so into serving. Jesus got onto his knees and washed the feet of the disciples. He was serving. He took his robes off and he washed. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He stands up afterwards and he says, this is how I want you to lead. Jesus led the disciples by serving. He wants us to lead by serving. You will find yourself at a time where maybe as you serve others, suddenly their successes you'll celebrate in. And as they go through a struggle, you'll cry with them as you journey with them. I've learned that as you serve others and you start celebrating their success and you develop the theology in you that says, your success is my honor. Say to your neighbor, your success is my honor. Family, I don't believe we, as the church, celebrate other people's successes enough. We've got to start celebrating and cheering people on. And when people are going through difficult times, that we weep with them. But when we go through good times, that we laugh with them. So can I ask you to consider serving in your home, as you go home today even, look for ways you can serve. Maybe men, you could serve by washing the dishes. Maybe you could serve by cooking a meal. Maybe you could serve by helping the children. Serve your family. Jesus served his family. Second thing is serve in your local church. Find ways that you can serve. Serve in your workplace. And as you do this, I believe the fruit of the Spirit starts to flow through you. Listen. Just as I end, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says this. But this I say, remember the scripture, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let everyone give as a purpose in their hearts, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then God will make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. How do we do this? First, sowing in our hearts, because we've all got issues. We're all messy. Second, sow into fellowship with God, which means your fellowship with one another. Third, sow into discipleship. Fourth, so into serving. Jesus modeled that for us. Can I ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes? And as you do, just as you see it before the Lord, if there's anyone this morning that recognizes they've been sowing wrong words into family, into friends, into work colleagues, they've been reckless with their words and recognizing that as we start 2023, that we've got to deal with our heart. Our heart needs to be realigned, that we recognize we're on a journey in life here now to deal with our heart, where we allow the Holy Spirit to work with our heart because we're not saying what we should when we should. We're not doing what we do, should do when we should do it. The things we don't want to do, we do. The things that we don't, that we do want to do, we don't do. If that's you, can I just ask you just to lift your hands? I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Father, you see the hands going up, and I pray for a release, a release on each one, Father, that you would give them 
revelation of your presence, your love for them. And Father, now that your word would become powerful and active in them, that you would help their hearts to be healed in Jesus' name, restored in Jesus' name. That 2023 will see an outpouring of your spirit, your grace upon them, to abound, to do every good work that you want them to do in submission to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keeping your heads bowed, please, eyes closed. If you recognize that you need God to deal with your heart, can I ask you just to stand where you are? Just If you recognize there are heart issues that you need surgery on, that you need God to deal with, can I just ask you to stand where you are? If you recognize this morning that you've withdrawn your fellowship from God and you need to come back into the presence of God, can I ask you just to stand? If you recognize if you've withdrawn your fellowship with man, with one another, and you found yourself isolating yourself as a pattern and withdrawing and you recognize it's wrong, can I ask you to stand before God and say, Father, that's me. If you recognize you haven't been discipled and you haven't been intentional in discipling others, can I ask you to stand before the Lord? And if you recognize you haven't been serving at home the way God has called you, and you haven't been serving in the local church, you haven't been serving in work because you've got hurt, can I ask you to stand before the Lord? And as you do, I pray. I asked you to stand because I believe God wants a public confession to Him that He can open heaven and pour His grace upon you, that His work can begin in you. Father, I lift up your sons and your daughters as we stand before you. And we ask now for an outpouring of your grace on each one's life. We confess, Father, we desperately need you as our first love. Come into our hearts and be our first love. Now help us to, through your word, realign our hearts. To come into fellowship with you. Come into discipleship with you. And look to serve you and to serve others, because you lead us to, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask if we can all stand before the Lord and just sense that there might be some here this morning who feel like you need God to really pour out wisdom into your heart for this moment. There's, you need wisdom, you need understanding, and you need God's grace right now for 2023. As we worship God, as we sing to Him and ask Him to hold us now, can I invite you just to come and kneel before God? Just a personal time of kneeling before God and letting Him flood you with His Spirit. Letting people pray over you as you seek God's face for this season. Because he wants you to thrive spiritually and emotionally. In Jesus' name, amen.